بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام على بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليك يا داعي الله وربانيا آياته السلام عليك يا باب الله وديان دينه السلام عليك يا خليفة الله وناصر حقه السلام عليك يا حجة الله ودليل إرادته السلام عليك يا تالي كتاب الله وترجمانا السلام عليك في آناء ليلك وأطراف نهارك السلام عليك يا بغية الله في أرضه السلام عليك يا ميثاق الله الذي أخذه ووكده السلام عليك يا وعد الله الذي ظمنه السلام عليك أيها العلم المنسوب والعلم المسبوب والغاوث والرحمة الغاثة وعدا غير مكذوب السلام عليك حين تغوم السلام عليك حين تغعود السلام عليك حين تقرأ وتبين السلام عليك حين تسلي وتغنوت السلام عليك حين تركع وتسجد السلام عليك حين تهلل وتكبر السلام عليك حين تحمد وتستغفر السلام عليك حين تصبح وتمسي السلام عليك في الليل إذا يغشى والنهار إذا تجلى السلام عليك أيها الإمام المأمون السلام عليك أيها المقدم المأمون السلام عليك بجوامع السلام أشهدك يا مولاي أني أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله لا حبيب إلا هو وأهله وأشهدك يا مولاي أن عليا أمير المؤمنين حجته والحسن حجته والحسن حجته 
ولی ابن الحسین حجت و و محمد ابن علی حجت و و جعفر ابن محمد حجت و و موسی ابن جعفر حجت و و علی ابن موسی حجت و و محمد ابن علی حجت و و علی ابن محمد حجت و و الحسن ابن علی حجت و و اشهد انکه حجت الله انتم الاول و الاخر و ان رجعتکم حق الله ریب فیها یوم لا ينفع نفسا ایمانها لم تكن آمنت من غل او كسبت في ایمانها خیرا و ان الموت حق و ان ناکرا و نکیرا حق و اشهد ان النشر حق والبعث حق وأن الشراط حق والمرصاد حق والميزان حق والحشر حق والحساب حق والجنة والنار حق والوعد والويد بحما حق يا مولاي شغيا من خالفكم وسعد من أطاعكم فاشهد على ما أشهدك علي وانا ولي لك بريء من عدوك فالحق ما رضيتموه والباطل ما اسخدتموه والمعروف ما امرتم به والمنكر ما نهيتم عنه فنفسي مؤمنة بالله وحده لا شريك له وبرسوله وبامير المؤمنين وبكم يا مولاي أولكم وآخركم ونصتي معدة لكم ومودتي خالصة لكم آمينا بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم سلام علیکم برادرز اند سیسترز تانک یو سو مچ فور جوینینگ اس این اور ویکلی پروگرام تونایت دیس تونایت یو وود لایک تو سلیبریت ات دی آسپیشس برث اف امام حسن عسکری دی فادر اف اور بیلوود امام زمان علیه السلام ان اولسو وی وود لایک تو کمیموریت دی پاسینگ اف لیدی فاطمه معصومه the sister of Imam Reza alayhi salam. Uh, we'll have a special speaker, uh, Dr. Takim. He's a professor uh, at McMaster University. Uh, we are very delighted to have him in our program. And uh, 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 soon we'll start the program uh, with him. Uh, uh, salam bar baradaran akharan aziz. Uh, khayli mamnoon ke tashif awardin be barnameh هفته ی امشب میخواستیم این هفته جشن بگیریم تولد ولادت با سعادت حضرت امام حسن عسکری علیه السلام و حضاداری کنیم برای وفاد جانگداز حضرت فاطمه محسومه 
سلام الله علیه ها آی دکتر تکیم امشب قدم رنجی کردن و توی برنامه ما شرکت کردن و without further ado we'll ask دکتر تکیم تو انشاءالله provide his beneficial speech بر محمد و آل محمد سلامات اللهم صل علی محمد و آل محمد دکتر تکیم over to you Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so if any, if at any point you cannot hear me, uh, just let me know, um, because I don't know whether you can hear me or not. Yeah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen, khatim al-nabiyyin, rahmatu lil-alameen, bil-qasim Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولله الأسماء الحسنى فادعوه بها صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد My dear sisters and brothers it is a great pleasure and an honor to be here in front of you. I believe that this is the first time that I'm actually addressing the community, which I believe is predominantly in Baltimore. Uh, it, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to be talking to you. And uh, hopefully one of these days, once the pandemic is over, uh, we will meet in person. Uh, I've been to Washington, Baltimore, a number of times in the past. I used to live in Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia, because of uh, Mr. Trump, Charlottesville has become well known now. But uh, I used to live there and I used to uh, come to Washington and uh, even to Idare uh, Jafaria in uh, Baltimore. I've been there a number of times. So inshallah, we shall uh, see you in the near future, God willing. We are marking today the wafat of Hazrat Masuma and the wiladat of Imam al-Hassan al-Askari, alayhi salam and uh, I will talk about them in a few minutes. But I want to also talk about something which is very dear to me, something that we hardly ever hear about. There is a very beautiful verse in the Quran which says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ husna, فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا To God belong all the beautiful names. So you call upon Allah through His names. And what I want to talk about in this first part of the lecture is the concept of beauty. Because as you are aware, whenever we open uh, the televisions in the media, Islam is always known as this terroristic militant religion, uh, a religion which is prone to violence. This is how they project it. But in reality, when we open our own Quran, we find a very different picture. The Quran says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ husna." To Allah belong all the beautiful names. So call out to his names. There is a beautiful hadith which says, Allahu Jamilun wa yuhibbul Jamal. God is beautiful and he loves beauty. We never think of Allah as beautiful, huh? And yet in this hadith, Allah is called as one who is beautiful. The source of all beauty in Islam is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only is Allah beautiful, He creates beauty all around. I don't know whether you have beautiful areas in Baltimore or where you live. I used to live in Denver, Colorado. I lived there for almost nine years. And for those of, been, uh, of you who have been to Denver will know that you see the mountains, the Rocky Mountains, right in front of you from almost anywhere in Denver. And whenever I used to go to work, whenever I used to go outside, without even wanting to, the words Subhana Rabbi would come out of my mouth the moment you see the beauty of those mountains. Many a time you are walking near the sea, you see the sunrise, sunset, and you feel a peace and tranquility in your heart. Or you are in the forest, on a sunny day you hear the birds chirping away. You feel that presence and love of the beauty outside. Indeed, the beauty outside is so powerful so captivating that it feels a sense of beauty within you too. 
because Allah has created beauty. In Islam, we believe that not only is Allah beautiful, but also his names are beautiful. Remember, whenever you see the word HSN in English or in Arabic, it means beauty because husn comes from the word beauty. So names like Hassan, Hussein, Ihsan, Muhsin, Husn, they are all related to beauty. In the Quran, Allah says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ husna." To Allah belongs the most beautiful names. So Allah doesn't have beautiful names. He has the most beautiful names. Fad'uhu biha. If you want to reach Allah, reach out to him through his beautiful names. As we are aware, Allah has got 99 names. And most of these refer to and are connected to the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So is Allah is beautiful. His names are beautiful and he has created beauty all around him. And indeed, we feel that sense of beauty many a time when we are walking, whatever we do. There is a very beautiful hadith from the Prophet wasallam, when he says that Allah has made you beautiful. Now you make your character beautiful. In other words, we have to make our character beautiful just as there is beauty all around us. You remember that very wonderful hadith from the Prophet where he says, I have been sent in order to perfect the akhlaq, the manners, the etiquettes. In other words, there are different grades or levels of behavior. And the Prophet was not only showing us good behavior or akhlaq, but he says the perfect akhlaq, لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ akhlaq, So that I can perfect and show you what is the perfect manners. In other words, there are gradations or levels of beauty. And the Prophet showed us the highest level of beauty. It is very interesting. And this is something that we need to share with our non-Muslim friends, how beauty pervades the Quran. Wherever you see the word husna, ihsan, muhsin, anywhere in the Quran, know that it refers to beauty. It's pervasive everywhere. The Quran tells you that even when you talk to your non-Muslim friends, not talking about Muslim friends, it says non-Muslim friends, وَجَادِلْهُ بِالَّتِهِيَ أَحْسَنْ Before that, the verse says, وَدْعُوا إِلَىٰ سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْئِذَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ Invite people, invite them to the path of your Lord with mawida, with preaching. And the most beautiful way of inviting them. Invite them in a beautiful manner. When you talk to them, when you engage them, do so in the most beautiful way. In other words, when we talk to non-Muslims, especially the Quran, this verse is in the context of inviting others towards Islam. Obviously, you are talking here about non-Muslims because you don't invite Muslims towards Islam. They're already Muslims. But when you are inviting others towards Islam, the Quran says, invite them in the most beautiful way. You can see how beauty is so important in Islam. In English, we never ever call our children after the name of beauty. You never say, my son is called Mr. Handsome or my daughter is called pretty. It doesn't make sense, does it? But in Islam, we do that. We call somebody Hassan, Hussein. What is Hassan and Hussein? Beautiful. We call somebody Jamil or Jamile, Jamila. Someone who's pretty. Or we call somebody Ziba. Ziba means pretty. We call somebody Noor. In other words, we call people by the names of beauty. Why do we do that? Because in Islam, a name is not a, just an adjective, it's an attribute. An adjective is something which describes good, bad, beauty, ugly, and so on. But an attribute is something that you have. In other words, when you call Hassan or Hussein or Munira or Jamila or whatever it may be, Zahre, then you are supposed to have those 
attributes of beauty within you. Otherwise, what's the point of being called Muhammad al Hassan al Hussein? You can see very clearly then how Islam wants us to have the sense of beauty. The Quran even says, Idfa billatihiya ahsan. That when somebody does bad to you, you repel evil with the best form of manners. If somebody violates you, abuses you, calls you names, does wrong to you, you don't do the same to them. Otherwise, what's the difference between you and them? Idfa billatihiya ahsan. Repel evil with the most beautiful way. Where does this beauty start from? You know where it starts from? It starts from home. Yes, it emerges from Allah. But our beautiful acts start from home. With whom? Again, you will notice that almost everything that I've said is coming from the Quran itself. This particular verse is a very famous verse. You must have heard of it. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنَ إِحْسَانًا Your Lord has decreed that you will worship only Him, that you will only worship Allah. But the verse doesn't end there. It continues. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنَ إِحْسَانًا And you will do إِحْسَان to your parents. What is إِحْسَان? In my language, I speak Urdu. I speak Swahili. I speak a little bit of uh, different. My Farsi is what they call katipati. But ihsan in our languages means to do a favor. You can never ever do a favor to your parents after what they have done for you. Ihsan is to do beautiful deeds. Ihsan is to do beautiful deeds to whom? To your parents. And it starts, the beautiful acts start from your parents. You have to do beautiful deeds to them. Why should I do beautiful deeds? Why should I act in a beautiful way? And again, the Quran tells us, it tells us that you do beautiful deeds. Do beautiful deeds just as Allah has done beauty to you. In other words, just as Allah has put beautiful traits and characteristics in me, Manam Bayad, I should also behave as Tarike Ihsan, in a way of Ihsan to others. I should also do beautiful deeds to others because Allah has put beautiful deeds in me, beautiful characteristics in me. To put it differently, our beautiful acts are nothing but a reflection of the beauty that Allah has put within us. When we do evil, God forbid, when we behave negatively to others, you know what we are doing? We are actually suppressing and conflicting with our nature because Allah has not put evil within us. He's put beauty in us. When I behave, God forbid, in a bad way with others, what I'm doing is actually doing khianat to amanat. That is, I am deceiving what Allah has given me. Allah has given me beautiful deeds and I am supposed to reflect that beauty to others. Midunichi, Shiva Masjid Kadidid. You've seen a mosque, right? Yek Gonbad Dare. It has a Gonbad, a dome. And then here is a square underneath it. Why? Have you ever wondered? Because if you go and stand under a dome and look up at the dome, it signifies the heavens, the majesty and the love and the admiration of the heavens. In a way, the heavens pull you towards Allah. So that gonbad, that dome, is symbolically representing the heavens and the marriage of the heavens and the earth, the mosque in between. And so when you stand under the dome in a mosque, you are not only pulled towards the heavens, but you are also admiring the beauty that Allah has created you up there and down here. Because the two, the heavens and the earth, interact. Without rain, there can be no crops on earth. And without water evaporating, there can be no rain. The two are deeply linked, the earth and the heavens. The beauty up there and the beauty down here. And that's one way of signifying the mosque. 
people who often ask me that where is this Allah that you talk of? You keep telling us about this God. Where is this God that you're talking of? Where is he? And again, my answer, my response is, look at the Quran itself. In Surah an kabut which is Surah number 29 in the Quran, the very last verse, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا those who strive towards us, Allah says, we will most certainly guide them. Allah doesn't say we'll guide them. He says we'll most certainly. The noon that is uh, that noon at the end of is in Arabic is called noon ta'kid. Noon ta'kid means ta'kid mikune. That it is enforcing, reinforcing that not only will Allah guide you, he will most certainly guide you. But the verse doesn't end there. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ God is with those who do beautiful deeds. You want to find Allah? You find Him where there is beauty. Wherever there is beautiful deeds, there's virtuous deeds, you will find Allah there. Because the Quran says, says so, إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ Allah is with not only does Allah love those who do beautiful deeds, He is with them. That's where Allah is. Wherever there is evil, it shows the absence of Allah. To possess Ihsan then, to do beautiful deeds, is to open yourself to the divine compassion. You know, sometimes, I, by the way, I'm a professor in uh, Canada here. I teach Islamic studies. And yet sometimes I find that I learn from my students that they learn from me. In the papers they write, they say things that are mind-boggling. It says, oh my God, I'm a Muslim and I never thought about this. A student of mine wrote that Allah, God, not only creates, He also mercifies His entire existence. In other words, He fills His existence with His mercy. And that set me thinking, what does this student mean? That Allah fills his creation with mercy. You remember Dwai Kumail? The very first verse in Dwai Kumail. Allahumma inni as'aluka bi rahmatika lati wasi'at kulla shay. Oh my Lord, I ask you by your rahma, by your mercy, which encompasses and fills each and everything that you have created. That I ask you by your mercy that fulfills or encompasses, it actually envelopes everything that you have created. Not every person, not every place, but everything. In other words, Allah's mercy is everywhere. And you know something? I'd always tell this to my audience, that our mercy, our love, our compassion, our forgiveness cannot be selective. Remember this much. You cannot love a Muslim more than a kafir, because even that kafir is a human being. Even a non-Muslim is a human being. Our love should extend to the whole of creation. Allah doesn't say, that you do not love somebody else just because he's not a believer. Look at the ni'mah that Allah gives. Rain, for example. Rain is called rahma in Arabic because it is a form of rahma, God's mercy. But when it rains, the rain doesn't say that I will rain more on Muslims and less on kafir. It does sometimes it rains more on non-Muslims than on uh, Muslims. Why? Because rain is Allah's mercy and bounties and blessings. Because it is Allah's blessings, Allah's blessing is for all human beings. Rain does not select. And therefore, the best way for us to reach out to non-Muslims is to spread that message of Islam through that love, through rahmah, through forgiveness and through compassion. This is how we reach out to others. If we show hatred and anger and rancor to others, then instead of coming towards Islam, 
they will run away from Islam. As I said, that we need to beautify our soul. And the more we beautify our character and our soul, the more human we become. In other words, the more we beautify ourselves, the more or the better human beings we become. Ihsan, my sisters and brothers, means to reflect Allah's value in us. We become, to put it differently, a mirror of the divine image. Because after all, Allah doesn't come down on earth. What Allah does is to put his values, his attributes in us, and he wants us to show that attributes to others. And that's one thing that we should always ponder about. Normally, when you give something away, you have less of it. If I give money away, I have less of that money. But the beauty of Allah's attributes which he has given to us is this. The more you give away, the more you receive from the one who gave it to you in the first place. The more you love others, the more you receive the love of Allah. The more you forgive others, the more Allah will forgive you. The more that you show compassion and rahmah to others, the more you will receive the rahmah of Allah. This is the beauty of Allah's beauty, if you like. Therefore, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ الله, That adorn yourselves, make yourself virtuous with the qualities of Allah. Whatever qualities Allah has given to you, show it to others. Do not keep it to yourself. In a very beautiful hadith al-Qudsi, hadith al-Qudsi, are the hadiths coming from Allah. We cannot be sure of their authenticity. But what we do know is they are very, very inspiring. Allah says, Abdi atti'ani aj'aluka mithli. O my servant, obey me and I will make you like me. Do you understand the implications? Obey me. Atti'ani aj'aluka mithli. I will make you like me. We cannot become God, but we can become the image of Allah in the sense that we personify, we show the attributes that Allah has given to us. Remember this much, my sisters and brothers, that in different parts of the Quran, sometimes Allah asks us, sometimes Allah tells us, but a few times He commands us. And a commandment is wajib. A recommendation, you can say yes or no. But a commandment is wajib to follow. And therefore Allah says, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Allah commands you. Amr mi genja. Inja amras. Sireh amras. That tawsiyanis. It's not a recommendation. That Allah commands you. That you will do adl, in Allah ya'muru bil adl, wal ihsan, and you will be just and you will do good deeds. So doing good deeds is not an option, my friends. It's a requirement of being human. And as I said, those good deeds should be there for others, not just for ourselves. Many a time, I find that we as human beings play the role of God. We want to decide who's going to go to heaven or hell. Fulan, ishun kafire, ishun nar jahannamire, ishun hatman sadar sad jannatiyas. That this person is going to go to jahannam. Arabi, who are we to decide? Allah tells us, do not compete for religion. Fasta bikul khairat, the Quran says. Compete for virtue. Fasta bikul Khairat. In other words, you decide and you compete for who does the most beautiful deeds. Indeed, even when it comes to marriage, a question of a man and a woman coming together, what does Allah say? That amongst his signs is that he has created a spouse for you. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّ وَالرَّحْمَةِ 
that Allah has put between you, the man and the woman, what has he put between them? Mawadda and Rahma, affectionate and mercy. In other words, unlike us, we tend to see marriages in terms of rights and responsibility. You do this, I do that. You are here, I am there. That's not what marriage is all about. Marriage in the Quranic understanding, mawadda and rahma. Marriage is an opportunity to reflect and share Allah's love. It's a way of reflecting and sharing Allah's love. Share with who? First, you share it with your spouse. Because if you cannot love your spouse, you cannot love anybody else. Why? Because Allah has put that love and mercy between you and your spouse. Remember, and with this I will go into Hazrat Masuma. Remember this, my sisters and brothers, the way to Allah passes through humanity. If you want to get to God, you have to go through humanity. You cannot love God if you hate the creatures of Allah. You cannot love a parent if you are hating the children of that parent. If you want to love somebody, you also have to love the children because the children are part and parcel. They share the blood ties with the parent. You want to love Allah, you will have to love the creatures of Allah. And the way to the creatures of Allah is also through Allah. The two are interconnected. Humanity and the divine. My sisters and brothers, we are marking today also, apart from the wilayat of Imam al-Hassan al-Askari, the wafat of Hazrat Masumaikum. Mandar kum zindagi kardam. Khayli ali bud. Wakian megam. Kesi guft beman ke in kum is a shun guft beman ke. She said to me that kum is a spiritual home to you. I wasn't born in kum, but it's my spiritual home. Because it has a very, very special effect. Why? Not only because of the hawze but because of Hazrat Masuma. I'll share an anecdote with you. This happened in 1983, when the first time that I went to Qom. And I'm sorry to make it personal, but I want to share with you what Hazrat Masuma can mean to a person. That I went to Qom for the first time, I knew nobody. I could barely speak a few words of Farsi. I've had a friend of mine living in Tehran. He came to receive me and dropped me in Qom. And even before we parted, I said, oh my God, I don't know anybody. I don't speak their language. What am I going to do? As we were about to part, me and my friend, he dropped me just outside Qom. In those days, if you remember Qom, you can actually pass the cars used to be able to pass next to the Haram. He parked at the Haram. And he dropped me and he pointed at the haram. And he said, I know you're feeling lonely. Go to her. Cry out to her. She'll help you. He pointed to the haram of Hazrat Masuma. And he was absolutely right. Because had it not been for Hazrat Masuma and her help to me, I would not have been what I am today. I am what I am because of her. I used to visit. I used to study. And I spent most of my time in the haram of itself. Why Masuma? Why was she called Masuma? Her actual name was Fatima. Fatima. Because she is proving to us that piety, uprightness, virtue is not gender specific. Any man or woman can be pious, can be virtuous. You don't have to be a man. In that sense, even a woman can be a role model for a man. A woman can be a role model in terms of piety, in terms of virtue. Qum, by the way, was always Shia. Iran became Shia primarily after the Safavid Safa dynasty in 1501. But there were certain areas in Iran which were predominantly Shia. Rai was one of them and Qum was another. The mother of Hazrat Masume was Najma the wife of Imam Musa al-Qadim. The title was given to her as Masuma because, as I said, of her piety. And she, Hazrat Masuma, was very close to Imam al-Radha, 
after the imam went to marv what we now call mashhad she wanted to join her brother so she and according to some riwayat approximately five brothers and a group of others left from Madinah, which where she used to live to go towards what we now call mashhad marv and as she was traveling others joined her according to some riwayat that i've seen there were almost 300 people and ma'amun was scared that she might become so popular that people might turn away from him so he instructed his governor in shiraz to block harith masuma and the group that was coming towards marv just outside shiraz there ensued a battle her brothers had to leave there was a lot of um, conspiracies and you know um, there was even some reported uh, imam uh, rida had passed away in mashhad even before he had actually passed away this was in order to break the ranks of the army that accompanied hazrat masuma according to some reports her brothers at least ahmad muhammad and hussein are buried near and around shiraz not too far from there but hazrat masuma herself was uh, came to the outskirts of qum that is a place called sawa and that's where she heard that uh, imam rada had passed away and she became sick she was very close to her brother to imam rada she herself was erudite very very um what we may call scholastic there are several hadith also reported from her indeed one of the main hadith a tradition on khadir starts from fatima to fatima to fatima up to hazrat fatima in other words i remember this because one of the scholars was telling me in the haram of hazrat masuma that this is called the special hadith of khadir starting from hazrat masuma fatima to fatima to her fatima to another fatima right up to hazrat fatima hazrat zahra and she also narrates many hadith on the rights of intercession to those who die on the love of ahlul bayt as i said she became sick at sawa she could not move on when the people of qum heard that hazrat fatima masuma is close to qum they went out to her to sawa and implored her to come to qum eventually she ended up coming to qum and stayed at the house of musa bin khazraj for those of you who have been to qum and i know many of you have been it's called baitul nur today it's a wonderful place by the way i've been there a number of times and it's a, a house where she lived it's called the house of um nur baitul nur she lived there only for 17 years and she was young by the way she was only 28 years old according to some reports when she passed away after she passed away musa bin khazraj the one who had accommodated her had a vast orchard and she was buried in it orchard which is now of course the haram within 50 years of hazrat masuma's passing away a shrine was built there and indeed many great shia scholars as we are aware not only visited not only now but even in the past visited qom why not because it was a center of learning in those days because of the presence of hazrat masuma indeed according to the report that i have seen it was because of the orders of imam hasan al askari that a person by the name of ahmad bin ishaq built the oldest mosque in qom today the masjid uh, uh, azam as it's called in qom masjid imam also is called so qom by the way i don't have the time to go into the details is full of history today we know that qom what it is what it is today because of two main factors the first and most important because of hazrat masuma and secondly because of the revival of the religious sciences and the hauze which is uh, based in qom i am myself a product of that and i can tell you one thing that living in qom was one of the best period of my life it gave me something that no other place could give me i've lived in different places in america in england in canada but no other place can compare with qum the spirituality 
there was very something very special for those who have been to Qom. That when you go to that sanctified haram, you not only are in the haram of Imam of Hazrat Masuma, you feel her spirituality. Ya Fatima tu ishfiqali fil jannah, fa inna laki in the shan min al shan. You recite this in the ziyarat of Hazrat Masuma. O oh, Fatima, grant me your intercession because you have a very special place in front of your Lord. I also want to talk very briefly because my time is up now on, on Imam Hassan al Askari, our 11th Imam. The Imam, as we are aware, died at a young age, some say 26, 27, in Samarra. Samarra. He was born in Medina, but he was lived during the time of Al Mutawakkil in the Abbasid period. This was a very difficult time, by the way, for the Shias. Mutawakkil was actually very anti-Shia. If you recall, he was the one who demolished, completely demolished the mausoleum, the shrine of Imam Hussein in Karbala. He was so anti-Shia that it was against the law in those days to visit Karbala. You could be killed just for visiting Karbala to do the ziyarat. And even then, the Shia said, we will die, but we will not stop visiting Karbala. It was under very difficult conditions that Imam Hassan Laskari lived. He lived, as I say, for quite a number of years in Medina. But a time came when Mutawakkil decided that he wanted our 10th Imam, Imam Ali Naki, to be in Samarra. And therefore, Imam Ali Naki, alayhi salam, was summoned and he was forced to go to Samarra. I do not know how many of you have been to Samarra. May Allah give us the opportunity to go to Samarra to, together, inshallah. Samarra, even in those days and even now, is a hostile place. It's not a place that you want to stay. Although there are Shias there, but it is part of what they call the Sunni Triangle. I've been to Samarra at the time. Even at the time of Namaz, even today you go to the time of Namaz, there are just a handful of people in the Haram. And most of those are outsiders. But Samarra has always been that kind of very hostile to the Shia place. Imam Ali Naki was actually in exile under house arrest in um, Samarra. You might ask yourself, why was Imam Hassan al-Askari called al-Askar? Askari is the same word that we use in other languages. Go guards, army, Askari in Swahili. Askar meant, of course, guards, kind of policemen. Why? Because Samarra was surrounded by the guards. For the first time we find when Al-Mu'tasim, Mu'tasim was the brother of Ma'mun, who built Samarra and made it his capital. He brought in Turkish guards to, con to protect him. These caliphs of the Basid caliphs, they could not rely on their own guards to protect them. Many a time, it was the guards who decided, the, the soldiers who decided who was going to be the caliph. And if they did not like the caliph, they ended up killing the caliph. So the caliph wanted guards who he could rely upon. And because of the presence of so many guards, Imam Hassan Laskari was called Al-Askar. In fact, both Imam, the 10th and 11th Imams are often referred to as Al-Askariyain, the two Askars, the two Imams who were, who were surrounded by by the bodyguards, not their bodyguards, Mutawakkil's bodyguards. Imam Hassan Laskari also realized the time was soon coming that he would not be able to communicate with his Shias. You'll find one thing. There are traditions from Imam Hassan Laskari, but few. Because of the condition that he was living in, that he was not able to communicate with his Shias. So even when people were able to visit him for a short period and they brought him the zakat, the hummus, or any other voluntary donations, you know what the imam would do? He had already foreseen the dangers that were coming. He had already appointed agents, special agents. And he would tell the Shias that go and give this to Uthman bin Said al-Amri. 
one of the, the first agent of our talk team was a uh, uh, person by the name of Uthman bin Said al Amri. Why? So that the Shias would get used to the idea that they would no longer be able to meet the Imam. Many a time when the Shias would come to meet Imam Hassan Laskari, he would actually put a parde, a, a curtain between himself and his followers. Why would he put a curtain between himself and his followers? To get his followers used to the idea that you will no longer be able to see or even communicate with your Imam directly. These were some of the most difficult times. And yet, the people also doubted whether Imam Hassan Naskari actually had a son at all. For those who were very close to the Imam, and remember, because of the difficulties of the time, the Imam could barely communicate with his own followers. And therefore, who actually tells us the birth of the 12th Imam, who actually witnessed it? Narjis Khatun. Huh? That she, um, sorry, Hakime, who was the aunt of the ninth Imam, Narjis was the mother, but Hakime, who was the aunt, she witnesses the birth. And a few select of the followers of Imam Hassan Asghari tell us that when they came to the Imam, the Imam showed them the little child. Because people were doubting, where is this child? Where is the successor to the Imam? So the, those very few Shias who actually saw the 12th Imam bore witness to the seeing that yes, there was a child to Imam Hassan Laskari. As you may be aware, after the passing away, the demise of Imam Hassan Laskari, the Shias themselves split into up to 12 factions, different groups, each with a different understanding as to what happened to the Imam after Imam Hassan Laskari. This goes to show us the difficulties of the time. But he also goes to show us the steadfastness, the taqwa, the uprightness, not only of the Imam himself, but what the Imam expects out of us. And therefore, there are so many hadith which tell us that one of the signs of a true Shia is that he recites the Ziyarat Arba'een. Some reports say this is from the 11th Imam, some say from the 10th Imam, that you recite Ziyarat Arba'in. This is one of the signs of a Shia. My sisters and brothers, I see I've taken more than enough of your time. Inshallah, we will meet in person soon. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Dr. Tahim, for that. My insight. pleasure. It's my honor. Appreciate it. Uh, brothers and sisters, let's recite the salawat for the health and well being of Dr. Tahim. Allahumma sallallahu Muhammad. Dr. Takim in his speech uh, referred to people who pass away in the Sabil Allah in God's way. I just wanted to let brothers and sisters know that unfortunately, Munafiqin have assassinated one of Iranian scientists, Ustad Fakhrizadeh, today. Uh, we pray for his soul and uh, for comfort and rest for his family members who were injured in the accident, actually. Uh, uh, without further ado, we'll turn over to uh, Mr. Azami to recite, inshallah, the dua of Khatme Jalase. Mr. Azami, khidmat shama. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum. Farajahum wa ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Assalamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah wa ala al-arwah al-lati hallat bi fanaik Alayk minni salamu Allah abada Ma baghitu wa baghi al-layl wa al-nahar Wa la ja'alahu Allah wa akhir al-ahd minni li ziyaratikum السلام على الحسين وعلى علي ابن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين وجسة المعصومين من زرية الحسين 
عليه السلام السلام عليك يا مولا يا غريب الغربا يا معين الصفاء والفقراء السلطان أبو الحسن يا علي ابن موسى الرسام ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا مولا يا صاحب الزمان يا شريك القرآن يا قاطع البرهان يا إمام الإنس والجان السلام عليك وعلى أبائك الطيبين الطاهرين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته جات خشنودي أموات أموات المؤمنين المسلمين أموات الجماعزين أموات بانيين برنامه و خشنودي روح حضرت معصوم سلام الله علیه ها و همچنین امام حسن اسکری و ائمه معصومین به ویژه امام زمان علیه السلام سلامتی آقای امام زمان و همچنین با تاثر و تاسف درور برادر عزیز زمان فخری زاده را برای آقای امام زمان تسلیت عرض می کنم ان شاءالله امیدوارم که خداوند دست منافقین تمام بلاد مؤمنین مسلمین قد و قل بنماید بر محمد و آل محمد اجماعا سلوات اللهم صل علی محمد و آل محمد سلام علیکم علیکم دو کمی اس ا کوئسچن فرام دکتر تکیم اور از ات اوت اف تایم I think that Kim, do you have a couple minutes? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Takim, thank you for accepting this um, to speak for us. I really appreciate it. Jazakallah. Um, I just want to have a question. I, about a year ago, I read a, an article from by you. Uh, it's kind of related to the topic because um, that article was very fascinating. It was about the discrimination against uh, Shia converts. Uh -huh. And um, I was wondering, how, what do you recommend in terms of how it can be? Because it's become a huge issue. Uh, I've seen a lot of converts that because of this sense of not feel, feeling belonging to the community, they go back to the old path. And I was wondering what do you suggest? Because that article was very fascinating. I recommend everybody else to also read it. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have to alter and change our mindset in many ways. Because the younger generation, our youths, do not have those ethnic discriminatory ideas that we do. You know, and uh, frankly speaking, let's be honest about it. We are too ethnic centered. We are too ethnically divided within the Shia community. And many times we end up discriminating without even realizing it, maybe, uh, or looking down upon others. So we need to change that mindset. But above all, I think that we need to also speak about and to the converts, whether it is blacks or whether, I assume you're talking about the African-American converts, right? Correct, correct. So whether we're talking about the whites or the African-American, we need to welcome them in our centers. At the same time, we need to discuss their issues make them feel a part of the community. So because, and I, I understand this is very natural that, you know, Iranians want to speak Farsi in their mosque, Iraqis want to speak Arabic, the Pakistanis want to speak Urdu, and they want to conduct their programs the way that they used to do it back home. But then where does it leave the African-Americans? The problem is, you see, in the Sunni case, for example, the African-Americans, the Sunni community is not as divided ethnically as we are. So th they can integrate the African-Americans much easier. Plus, there are so many African-Americans in the Sunni community, they've built their own mosques through. But the numbers of Shias, African-Americans, are so few that many of them who are coming for, out from prisons, not all of them, but many of them coming out of, from prison or even just converting don't have any resource. 
So they feel alienated, sometimes discriminated against. But I think that uh, things are changing and people are becoming more aware for the need to reach out. Thank you, Thank very you much. so much for the question and Dr. Taking for your time. Inshallah, everyone, have a great night and great weekend. Thank you for uh, that. Uh, uh, Sukhan Lali ask, uh, can you please post the uh, article's name and link, please? Or, or Hadi, would you please do that? Uh, um, which article? Because I've written a number of these articles, you know, so I cannot um, remember offhand. Um, but it, I can give you my... Um, um, email address. If you do that, then uh, I think. Which? Uh, how? When was this, brother Hadi? When was this article published? Do you remember? I don't remember. Which one is it? Um, I, I was a couple of them, but I don't remember exactly. Yeah, I've written a number of articles on Africa. I would suggest that if you want to, I don't want to advertise my own book. Well, frankly, I don't get much uh, out of it anyway. But my book oh, is called Shiism in America. Shiism in America is now available on um, Amazon and actually will give you a whole perspective of Shia Islam, the origins, a history, and contemporary issues regarding the Shia community in America. There I have a good section on the African-American converts to Islam in chapter five. Um, and, uh, you know, I discuss about this. Let me see if I can find, find that article from my CV. Um, Yeah, it's sometimes it's a problem. But if you can email me, you know, I'd be quite happy to do that. I just sent a link to your book on Amazon, Dr. Tehi. So anybody interested can like find it and read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if there is a link. Yeah, yeah, okay, yes. And um, I don't know, maybe I can put uh, my email to everybody, whoever wants to. Um, I'm trying to do it. Uh, hang on a minute. Uh, everyone, I'll put it. And if you can email me, I'll be more than happy to share it with you. Uh, you know, I can send you the article directly uh, without you having to buy it or anything like that. I don't mind. Okay, I put my email down there, and I'll even put my phone number down. Quite happy. Thank you very much. Thank but, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye.